Oh, I'm sorry. We have to do the question. Yeah, pre-debate survey. Sorry. <clears throat> okay, overwhelming on the side of I am now. Okay. <laughs> All right, so first we'll have uh, Dr. Hassan Mir from Tampa uh, come up and talk to us about uh, uh, the treatment of intertrochanteric hip fractures with ORIF. All right, thanks. All right, so uh, our small group was a pretty nice discussion. Hopefully everybody else had good discussions in their rooms, and I think some of them are still going. But uh, as, they, as they come in, we'll kind of debate this topic over the next 10 or 15 minutes, and then go from there. So our debate is, uh, is on this case here. So this is a 75-year-old female, ground level fall, isolated injury, uh, relatively healthy community ambulator. It doesn't say uh, if she uses a walker or not, uh, but likely not if it's not mentioned here. And so we've got to discuss if we would fix this with a sliding hip screw versus a cephalomedullary nail. So how many folks in this room have used a sliding hip screw, dynamic hip screw, all right. How many folks under the age of 40 have used a sliding hip screw, dynamic hip screw? I only see like two hands going up, maybe three or four. Yeah. Okay. So a lot less, right, with that. And that's been the practice trend, right? Everybody's nailing everything because it's easier, faster, et cetera, et cetera. But I'm going to try to convince you that maybe we shouldn't always be doing that, even though, disclosure, I nail them all. But so... Um, with films, with, with any injury, right, you want to have adequate workup, adequate films. So this is uh, an AP pelvis, right, not just an AP of the hip, because the film that I actually have up in the operating room is the AP pelvis, because I'm templating, even though that's a lost art too, right? How many of you have actually taken out uh, fracture paper and templated for a case, right? It's a lost art. But at least mental templating, having the contralateral hip to look at your neck shaft angle, and then to look at the relationship between the tip of your trochanter and the center of your femoral head. That's a, that's a really good way to judge your varus valgus alignment, is not just the neck shaft, because that can be rotationally affected, but the tip of your troch to the center of your femoral head uh, is less affected by rotational uh, differences side to side. Um, Something else that can be helpful uh, in the workup of these patients is occasionally we get these injuries, especially in stable appearing patterns, where it's kind of difficult to tell if the troch's involved or not. Is it a femoral neck or, a, or an inner troch? And, and that's a big difference in how you're booking the case. You're booking it for fixation versus an arthroplasty. So getting a gentle traction view can make a big difference for patient care and how you, uh, how you schedule the case so you don't get, uh, don't get yelled at by your attending when they show up the next morning in the wrong bed and the wrong implant systems in the room. Uh, as far as lateral imaging, this one's not showing up great, but uh, unless you really hate your geriatric patients, I would advocate for getting cross-table laterals and not frog legs. I don't know if you've ever seen them do a frog leg lateral on a, on a patient, but they literally grab them and externally rotate them through their fracture, and it's torture. So getting a cross-table lateral where they flex up the uninjured limb to look across at the injured hip is probably much more humane. And then getting full length views of the femur because we're having a lot more patients with implants at multiple spots in their, in their uh, anatomy that we have to sometimes contend with and looking at femoral bow. So as far as implant choices, right, we're debating uh, uh, sliding hip screw devices versus, versus nails. So if it's a stable pattern, really it's dealer's choice, right? So that can be a plate or a nail. But what does stability mean? So unstable is you have this involvement of the posterior medial cortex, which is this area right here, uh, that gives you some sort of support against varus collapse. So that's the, the posterior medial cortex. And, and that shouldn't be confused with the lesser trochanter. The lesser trochanter is a little further down, and you can have a lesser troch that's off, but still have a good, good posterior medial support on a proximal femur. 
Secondly, the obliquity of the fracture. The fracture that you see right here is standard obliquity, right? It starts up at the greater choke and goes down towards the le lesser choke. But occasionally you'll have these patterns that are reverse obliquity uh, that, that literally go the opposite way, and those are ones that are more unstable. Third, if you have extension into subtrochanteric zone, those are unstable patterns. And you know any of these unstable patterns, I think you're justified in saying that this patient needs a nail. And then fourth is the lateral wall, and this is the one that people don't always understand, but it's this little triangle of bone that's left after looking at all those other things. And that's, that's to give you a buttress support of when your hip is collapsing as patients are weight-bearing to keep it from just uncontrolled collapse and shortening a couple centimeters and ending up with, uh, with uh, abductors that aren't offset appropriately and shortening of the limb. So if you have... Um, any of these factors involved, then I agree, you should, you should nail them. If none of these things are involved, like in our case that we're discussing, this looks like a stable intertroch. So I would argue then that if you look at the literature, this is a Cochrane review from 2010, looked at 40, 43 randomized controlled trials and, and a very uh, robust methodology. And their argument was that, that uh, with lower complication rates in comparison with nails, uh, and absence of functional outcome data to the contrary, the sliding hip screw appears superior for stable trochanteric fractures. That's my ad lib in there is for stable fractures. Um, they also go on to comment that, that at least in 2010, this was looking at first generation nail devices and may have had higher complication rates. But uh, even with modern nail devices, I think that for stable fractures, that uh, sliding hip screws still have literature support. Secondly, uh, there weren't a lot of young hands going up that have actually done an open lateral approach to the hip, right? So uh, it's fun to nail fractures. It's quick. It kind of feels like a video game. You're doing it through these tiny incisions. Everybody likes small incisions. But open surgery is becoming a lost art. And there will be times when you have to do open approaches to the hip. So I think that if you have patients that are appropriately indicated, that have a stable fracture pattern, where you can actually do the open approach, see the anatomy, end up with an equivalent outcome that you should take advantage of those opportunities and still do those cases. And for, for folks who, who, who trained doing sliding hip screws more than nails, why give up on something that has a proven track record and good outcomes in addition to some other uh, aspects that we're going to talk about, which is this, the cost, right? So you've got the sliding hip screw type implants. You've got short cephalomedullary nails and then long cephalomedullary nails. And if you care about healthcare systems and you care about you know uh, the national deficit and care about the amount of money that we're spending on healthcare as part of GDP, you should care about this graphic because for a sliding hip screw construct, you're looking at you know depending on your contract with your manufacturers, et cetera. There's a whole lot that goes into this. Roughly 750 bucks for a short cephalomedullary nail about 1500 so about double and then for a long cephalomedular nail 2500 to 3 grand right so if you can get an equivalent outcome with an implant that costs half why would we not use that implant and why would we lose the ability uh, to physically learn how to do it and continue keeping up our skill set so this was going to be a much bigger deal for us how many of you know who Tom Price is Right, so a few hands going up. So he's an orthopedic surgeon from Georgia who was one of our champions when he was in the House of Representatives. Got a great opportunity with the Trump administration. Got, uh, was Secretary of uh, uh, Health and Human Service, Services in charge of uh, CMS and actually got rid of this hip fracture bundle. So we were all going to really care about this a lot if Tom Price hadn't be, uh, been in that role. But uh, so he gets rid of the shift bundle and was going to do a lot more for orthopedic surgery. But then, of course, he uh, decided to fly himself and his wife around the country and the world on, on taxpayer dollars and private jets in first class, and he's no longer in that position. But anyway, while he was still there, he canceled the hip fracture bundle, and so we don't care once again about cost of our implants. But I would say that that may circle back around eventually, uh, especially being in DC. Everything is about value. Everything is, it, all the discussions weren't about opioids. The other discussions were about value and, and bundled payments and things. So the hip fracture bundles may uh, come, back to, come back to haunt us in the future. So anyway, in summary then, I think that for stable fat fractures like this patient has, 
uh, you can get an equivalent outcome with a sliding hip screw. Open surgery is fun, right? As was mentioned earlier, all surgery is fun, but open surgery is a lot of fun if you haven't done this approach and want, or don't get to do it very frequently. It's a nice approach to do. It's a very elegant approach. You can be nice and do a subvastus, and it's a really elegant surgery. You can get a direct reduction. And then cost. I think that even though it's not out of our pocket with bundled payments yet, it is coming out of our tax dollars with Medicare. It is part of our health system, so we should be responsible whenever we can. Thank you. might get up from 17 to 18%. All right. <laughs> Next, we have uh, Dr. Rakesh Mashru uh, from Cooper uh, talking about intramedullary nailing of intertrochanteric femur fractures. So when, uh, when Sako gave me this talk, and I was excited. I was like, you know what? Nailing intertrochs, no problem. But then when I saw it to go up against Hassan, the, uh, the excitement sort of turned into anxiety. So I just want to say thanks, Hassan, for flying down from, uh, flying up from Florida. So. I want to be respectful to him. He has, actually has a flight to catch, so I'm going to be uh, purposely going quick through this. So my, my job is to convince you that uh, intramedullary nails are the way to go for intertrochanteric hip fractures. And a lot of what you just heard from um, Hassan, you're going to hear the exact same thing uh, from me. In fact, the slides are pretty much the same. So in general, the, uh, th this is a big problem. I mean, Hassan just uh, came up here and talked to you about how this is going to um, basically can sometimes overrun our system. The incidence of hip fractures is 250,000 hip fractures a year. Um, this is data from 2016 from the academy. Half of them are, of those are intertrochanteric hip fractures. The healthcare cost is gonna be over $9 billion. That was from 2016. And it's expected to double by 2015. So um, the cost issue, whether you pay attention to it or not, is actually extremely important because it is gonna come and play a major role um, as, the, as the years go by. So there, there's certain things when we get our patients, there's certain things we can control, there's certain things we, we can't control, right? And so we want to be cognizant of, of both things, right? So the uncontrolled parameters, we can't control how good the bones are in our patients, right? They show up to the ER, they're old, they're young, they're uh, medically unstable, they could be healthy, fracture personality we can't control, but there are things that, that, that we can control. How good of a reduction are we getting? I just mentioned earlier in a in the talk upstairs, you know, intertrochanteric hip fractures are one of the few fractures where if we get a malunion, we're high-fiving everybody in the room, right? It's great. It healed. It may not heal straight, but it healed, so that's great. There's, uh, th th there may be something to that. Implant selection, that's what we're going to talk about uh, and debate a little bit today, and then obviously implant placement, which is, the mo which is one of the more important things as well. It doesn't matter, you know, whether you pick a hip screw or intermedian nail. If you don't put it in the right way and in the right method, um, either one are, can be bound to fail. So it's important, again, just mentioned earlier, you must recognize the fracture pattern, stable versus unstable, and then you have different variants. So what makes one stable versus unstable? Again, this is just repeating what um, Dr. Mir just said, that postramedial comminution where the lesser trochanter is off, you have that lateral wall blowout, you have trochanteric comminution. A lot of us have been in those cases where we're starting to get our guide pin at the medial slope of the tip of the trochanter, and you can't even put the pin in there because the whole thing is just comminuted you sometimes just go straight to the, uh, the ball tip. And of course, you know, the reverse oblique and the subtroke variants. Again, this is just a schematic that was put up a little bit earlier. The only reason I put this in there, the top line, the, the A1s are the, are the stable ones. The A3s, the ones are, the, are at the bottom, are the, the variants. Those are unstable. And the ones in the middle, the A2s, are also, uh, I would argue, unstable. So what are the advantages of, of intermedian nails? There's a decreased moment bending arm compared with hip screws, right? That's just basic science, um, basic uh, physics analysis. There are lower rates of collapse. I think that's something we can agree about. There's going to be a lot of debate on which has more blood loss, which has lead blood, less blood loss in the OR over the course of, you know, a week. There's all studies showing, you know, uh, there's different parameters for each one. But lower rates of varus collapse have been shown with intermedian nails. The nails are obviously load-sharing, right? They're not load-bearing. The example that uh, Hassan just gave, again, percutaneous technique. I mean, we do a ton of nails at Cooper. And our residents have become pretty facile in doing them. They can do them in small incisions. They put them down, and it's, it's usually a very, very quick procedure. And the other thing is these patients who, that we're talking about, these geriatric hip fractures, it's pathologic bone, right? Why would you not want to prophylax the whole femur, right? We already know that they broke because of osteoporotic reasons for the most part, but why not protect the whole bone? Right? Because I can guarantee you sometime in your career, or if you're taking care of any of these patients, you will have a fracture below your hip screw. 
So just going through a couple of papers, and I'm not going to go through each one. Um, again, just trying to go quickly. Unstable uh, fracture patterns are becoming more common in geriatric population. This uh, international study, they showed that intermedian nails compared to hip screws had less, less intraoperative blood loss, less OR time, and early rates of ambulation. We also Sanjay just showed you a slide of the cost. Cost is a very dubious um, parameter, right? Are you just looking at the cost of the implant? Then sure, the cost, hip, hip, uh, hip screws are cheaper. But if you look at the course of the treatment of, of these fractures, if a hip screw fails, the cost is um, exponential. So hip screw and side plate is not always cheaper. If you have a stable fracture pattern, use a hip screw and they heal, yes, it's cheaper. But if they fail or if they have a complication or you need to revise it, there's a cost in failure as well. And that's something that has to be considered. Again, Baumgartner study uh, in core, this is a little bit of an older study, surgical time 23% less, blood loss is 44% less. And then user, depend, user dependence is really what uh, was a confounding factor in this study for fluoroscopy time. So as you get a little bit more facile, a little bit um, better with these, you know, locking distally with these long nails is actually doesn't take as long as sometimes we think. Um, all functional outcomes. Does using one implant versus the other make patients feel better? Do they get up quicker? Do they functionally do better? And there's no causal relationship. It's, it, there's no study that says that if you use a nail, you're 100% functionally going to be better versus a hip screw. There are correlations to earlier weight bearing that shows that nails can have uh, patients who uh, weight bear earlier compared with the hip screw, but I think the, the, the jury is still out. And if you just look at the third column in that table that I put up there, you can see that a lot of it says no difference, but there's two or three in there that says there's a correlation towards nails having earlier, um, earlier, earlier return to weight bearing. Again, these are other parameters. And it's a very busy slide, but again, these just go through uh, you know, intraoperative blood loss, which nails are less time to mobilization, which nails are also less. But again, these are all confounding factors. If you look at overall blood loss for you know, day, hospital day three, four, five, they sometimes become equivocal. The other uh, concept in terms of uh, functional outcome for these uh, patients is this concept of femoral medial, uh, medialization, excuse me, and less shortening. There are studies that have been shown, and I'll show you the, one of the last studies, that shows femoral medialization in nails are significantly less, and they correlate it to functional outcome. So there's higher rates of femoral medialization in sliding hip screws, and there's um, that medialization they've sometimes correlated to poor functional outcomes. So in conclusion, I would say all three unstable fracture patterns should be treated with an intermediate nail. Those stable, the ones that are non-displaced, not, don't, don't have those characteristics of what makes them unstable. A sliding hip screw is absolutely appropriate. I don't think the sliding hip screw is a dead implant. I think it's something we still need to teach in our training programs. But also just realize, I think as we progress, um, you know, surgeon and experience level also is, is, play, plays a role. A lot of times, you know, our, our, our younger residents haven't even put in hip screws yet. So, you know, we, we, we're definitely looking, uh, you know, for cases that we still need to teach them this technique. That's it. Thank you. Okay, we need to vote again. Sliding hip screw gained some, gained some fans, but still the IM nail takes it. All right. Thanks, guys. Um, next, we're going to uh, have a debate on uh, hemi versus total hip arthroplasty for displaced femoral neck fractures in the elderly. Um, I think we need to do the voting. Yeah. Oh. It's 
help. Okay. It's probably worth saying to finish the last talk that what in 2000, when inter the, the, the nails were introduced for this purpose, it was 80-20 hip screws. By 2001, it was 80-20 nails. And the reason for that switch was reimbursement. So it was always driven by, the, by cost. I mean, over time, there's a lot of clinical reasons to pick one or the other, but that literal flip was not because the hip screws stopped working. It was all about money then, just like it's all about money and everything. Well, they normalize that cost, yeah. differential math. Better. Okay, uh, we have a case of a displaced femoral neck. Um, 75 year old female, ground level fall, isolated injury. Uh, a few um, comorbidities, uh, and she is a community ambulator, retired, and lives with her husband. So, uh, first we have uh, Dr. Brady, who's going to talk about hemiarthroplasty. All right, so no matter where you work, whether you're working in a level one trauma center or a community hospital with no trauma designation or, you know, in a major city or not in a major city, we're going to see this uh, fracture. Uh, they're very common. We need to know what to do with them. So we know clearly this is a surgical indication. So uh, displaced femoral neck fractures, unless there is a contraindication for surgery, get surgery. So why should we do a hemiarthroplasty in this particular patient? So we look at our x-rays, and at least when I was a resident, we were always told to ask people, and I never saw a total hip for a, for a, a femoral neck fracture as a resident. We did hemis all the time anyway, but we were always told, told to ask the patients, well, did you have pre-existing groin pain before you came and broke your hip? And whether they said yes or no, we did a hemi on them. But uh, look at this. Um, the acetabulum looks okay. There's no osteophytes. There's no significant narrowing. Why will we subject this person to a, uh, a procedure that takes out normal anatomy? Why should we do hemiarthroplasty? Because it's, it's a universally accepted treatment. Everybody in their residency program has done a hemiarthroplasty. It's an approach, whether you do lateral approach or direct lateral or anterolateral or posterior approach, it's an approach that everyone knows well. You've seen it a thousand times before you finished your residency program. Uh, so you know how to do it, and you don't have to worry about trying to expose the acetabulum and causing other problems and getting medialization of your, of your acetabulum and, you know, penetrating into your bladder. It can be done quickly. So this can be done Monday morning, first case starter. This can be done on, you know, Sunday evening when it comes in because everybody knows the approach. And we know that there's an advantage to getting surgery for femoral neck fractures or hip fractures in general done early. We know that complications increase with surgery that's done after 24 hours, and there are some studies coming out recently that show that we might even want to push this to try and get surgery done within 12 hours of this patient hitting the ER. Um, studies have shown that there's an increased mortality, an increased length of stay, and an increase in medical complications if we delay surgery past 24 hours. Hemis generally have a lower risk of dislocation than total hip replacements because of the large head sizes that we're able to use with hemiarthroplasty. I think you may get some pushback from the total joint surgeons who say, you know, if I repair the capsule or if I do an anterior approach or with meticulous technique, I can decrease my dislocation risk. But those are people who do hip replacements for a living. That's all they do. Um, so if you do something over and over again, then yes, I think your complication rate is definitely going to be lower. Uh, however, not everybody who's going to be taking trauma call uh, or community hip fracture call is a total joint surgeon. Uh, and we know that with hemiarthroplasties, our dislocation rate is less. Um, we know that in just general, hip fractures are not necessarily always the problem. They're, the hip fractures may be a sequelae of an underlying problem. Sick people fall down and break their hips. They have cancer, they have dementia, they have coronary artery disease, and at uh, a year, up to 20 to 30 percent of these patients are going to be no longer with us. Uh, so with those type of numbers, it may be better, or it may not be cost effective, not that you want to put a, a cost uh, number on a life, but it may not be cost effective to do a, a higher uh, cost surgery on a patient who has a limited life expectancy. Um, we know that 
the, the, one of the reasons to think about why we would do a hip, uh, a total hip replacement uh, for hip fractures, because we're worried about uh, acetabular erosion and need for further revision surgery to, to convert that. However, there's a low incidence of conversion rates for hemiarthroplasty, total hip arthroplasties, because of acetabular erosion. And this recent study out of the Journal of Arthroplasty shows that for uh, patients under 75 uh, years old, the conversion rate because of acetabular erosion and acetabular pain to total hip replacement is only about 2.5%. And if you go with the patients who are over 75, which is who our patient is, um, your conversion rate is only about 1.4%. Uh, and that's an average time of conversion at 1.9 years. We know that good to excellent results can be done with, uh, with when total hips are done by arthroplasty surgeons, but as I said before, most of these fractures are not going to be done by the arthroplasty surgeons. There's a very good uh, review article in uh, the British Medical Journal uh, about where the cutoff point is. I think this won a resident uh, research award a few years ago. Uh, about where the cutoff point is in terms of surgeon volume. We know that if you don't do a lot of a certain surgery, your outcomes are not going to be very good. Uh, so if you, and that cutoff for uh, hip replacement surgeries tends to be about 35 cases per year. So if you're in my hospital, we do about 300 to 350 hip fractures uh, per year. Um, and we divide that up by about eight or nine surgeons who are taking call. Um, that's right about the cutoff of about 35 cases per year. And not everybody's doing arthroplasty. Um, so hemiarthroplasty, people can do, uh, or, or surgeons know how to do. Uh, with less complications. However, if you're not an arthroplasty surgeon, doing the totals may not be the right thing to do. And we know the arthroplasty surgeons operate on Tuesdays and Thursdays. They don't operate on Friday. They're out playing golf. They're wearing nice clothes, and they get all their cases done by 2 o'clock. So it's probably not worthwhile to have that person wait for the arthroplasty surgeon in order to get their surgery done. So hemiarthroplasty is a gold standard option for the displaced femoral neck fractures. It's surgery that can be done by anybody, or it should be able to be done by anyone who's uh, graduated from a competent orthopedic residency program. You get immediate mobility and pain control, and there's no need to wait for a subspecialist. Our concerns about having to convert these to total hip arthroplasties later on may be unfounded. Thank you. All right, next we'll have Dr. Jack Schilling from uh, Cooper talk about total hip arthroplasty. So the beauty of this talk is that I agree with Drew. And I think, you know, I, I was asked to, to do this partly because I'm, I'm probably one of the last, I won't say the only, because there's others, but in this, in the city, uh, joint surgeons that still take trauma call. And so Sock was kind enough to, and, and Mash were kind enough to throw, throw my hat into the ring for this. The, the interesting part of it is that when I, when I really talk about um, what we ought to do with these, I, I, I've debated this. This seems like such an easy conversation. But in the grand scheme of things, my job today is not to turn everybody into total hip surgeons on the weekend or at night for these in these cases because so much of what Drew said, frankly, I believe in. Um, you know, this is a particular case, a 76-year-old female, and, and, and when we were talking about what to do for this case, you know, and we were trying to use certain parameters, somebody between 70 and 75, something to make it controversial because if a 50-year-old breaks their hip in a car accident, you're going to do a total hip on them, and if, and if a 90-year-old breaks their hip, you're probably going to do a hemi on them. And it's, I mean, so we were trying to take some of the outliers out of the conversation. So, you know, 76-year-old female, displaced femoral neck fracture, fall from a standing height, um, mild, minimal preoperative hip pain, um, community ambulator without an assistive device, healthy, lives alone with no evidence for dementia. So these, I mean, going back to just the idea of what questions to ask and what to understand, because you're making decisions relatively quickly. Um, my decision about considering a total hip comes down to, if I'm, if I'm looking purely at patient factors, <clears throat> so much of it is age, so much, so much of it is activity, so much of it is comorbid conditions. Um, a huge believer in um, a clear mind makes a better patient. And uh, people, I mean, it, it, hip fractures and dementia, it's a bad combination because they just can't fight for themselves. So 
people who, and I, and I tell every patient, hip, uh, hip fracture patient, whether I'm considering a hemi or a total, look, if you were a community ambulator, you may be with a cane. You know, you just have to be prepared for the changes in your life that are coming. The mortality rates of hip fracture surgery, depending on who you read, even in 2018, it's six months. It's, it's a bigger number than you think when, it, when it's all comers. So, so, you know, you've got to make a lot of important decisions really quickly in the, in the process. So you can do this, which is a cemented hemiarthroplasty, and I threw cement in there because even though that's not what I'm talking about, I'm a pretty big proponent in a hip fracture population that you really ought to consider doing cemented cases um, when you have the opportunity. I mean, the bone quality here looks okay on the x-ray. On this particular case, I didn't love that, but I, I threw that in there just as sort of the either or. But both of these cases are, are going to be cemented. Or, or you can do this, which is what we did in, in the case in question, which was a cemented total hip. Um, I ended up choosing to do a total hip based on that lady that was laying in front of me in conversations with family and conversations with her about what she was doing and what her expectations were and how she was before and bone quality and what did her acetabulum look, at, look like at that time. And, and in the end, I also chose to do it because I do this all week. You know, and in this case, we happened to do on a Saturday and I didn't have the perfect team, but I felt comfortable that I could get through the case and make sure that the cup was in the right place and all those things on my own. But, but part of it is, going back to what Drew was saying at the end, I mean, <laughs> it is about your own specific comfort level with what you're, what you're trying to address. And you have to be honest with yourself about the situation. The patient, yourself, uh, the conditions in the operating room, I mean, it, 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 7 o'clock on a Sunday night if you've done five total <laughs> hips this year is probably not the right time to choose that. And that might be a reason to wait a day. Um, but, you know, it's it, it just, these are, the, these are the things to think about. It is about the x-ray, it is about the patient and what their functional status is, but it's about a lot of other things too when you're making this kind of a decision because in the end, HEMI's pretty bulletproof. So you, you better have a really good reason to do this and be really confident that you're going to do a better job with the total than a HEMI. Um, so, again, most get HEMI arthroplasty and, I mean, the, the, the Journal of Trauma 2014, Hockfelder, uh, <coughs> this was a New York State-based study, uh, Perry, a, a British national study. But basically, for displaced femoral neck fractures in 2014, 33,000 patients, 7% got totals. And in, uh, and in uh, uh, Europe, uh, Great Britain, British Medical Journal, 110,000 patients, 10% got a total. So I mean. Hemiarthroplasty is the gold standard, as Drew said. It is the right, it is the answer most of the time. Um, so when do you choose the others? And when, uh, when do you choose total hip versus hemiarthroplasty? Well, you know, I pulled a couple of articles that some of them say exactly the same thing. Frankly, a lot of the articles say the same thing. Um, and the two top studies, both large meta-analysis studies that basically say that if you do total hips, your dislocation rate is probably going to be a little bit higher, but you're going to have an overall lower reoperation rate, and in the end, if you pick the right people, higher functional scores. But you've just got to be careful when you're looking at these because it's, there's so much age bias and function bias. There's so much soft to these studies when you really look at the materials and methods about choosing um, who is going to be the ideal candidate for a total versus a hemi. So you're making a lot of decisions in a really small period of time. And, you know, we were talking about this upstairs. I mean, you've got five minutes to meet these people a lot of times and make a whole lot of value judgments. Um, the, uh, the U article from CORE in 2012 was just one of the, the best studies. Uh, it was a China stu Chinese study, but it was still one of the best studies that, that, that showed those three things, Incre increased dislocation rate, lower reoperation rate, higher functional scores. Um, there is a study that came out as recently as uh, last fall from the Netherlands in JBJS that basically showed that at 12 years in the 70 and over population, cemented total hip versus cemented hemi had no functional difference at, at 12 years. So the argument that you're going to have issue with cartilage pain and functional, issue, uh, functional pain moving forward um, I put that in there because it actually works against what I'm supposed to be supporting. 
but I think the point is, is that as someone who is a joint surgeon, you know, I, I feel like I'm the alien in this room a little bit, but I, I, the, the benefit of being the joint surgeon is that when, stu when these things fail, I, they come to me to fix. And what I will tell you, and I don't like the school of anecdotal medicine, but I, 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 there, there are not a lot of studies about high conversion rates, as Drew pointed out on one of his slides, from hemi to total. And in 19 years, I haven't seen a lot of that either. In my own population, are things referred into me. So I think HEMI is a fairly bulletproof thing. Um, I also love, there's, a, there's an article that literally just came out in the April 2018 issue of CORE um, by Dr. Bernstein at Penn. And he talks about um, what he called the Bandari paradox of HEMI versus total in this situation. And there's basically three things that he attributed the reason for there being 90 to 95 percent hemiarthroplasty versus total hip arthroplasty in this population. Um, it was a psychological study where if you talk to patients ahead of time and said, would you rather have a total or would you rather have a hemi, they all think that they want a total. Ninety percent said, I think a total's better for me without having, and these were people that didn't have a fracture and were laying there, you were just talking about the concept, but yet the actual numbers are the flip. And so the concept, uh, the, the, you know, there were three things that he talked about in, his, in the article, and, and one was that it's a really difficult decision to make because of all these different variables that we just got done talking about. Um, you're making a lot of big, small, a lot of big decisions, but very small decisions in a short period of time. Um, the other is that the economics of total hip in this situation aren't really supported. It's a more complicated pr a procedure with potential complications, but yet you don't really get much more money for it. So people are a little bit nervous about, uh, about pursuing that. And then the last is that we all think about things in, in sort of a biphasic mode where in the very beginning you make an emotional quick decision and then if you think about it for a little while you make a slower, more deliberate decision and sometimes those decisions aren't the same. Um, and our emotional decision is you're on call, you're trying to get work done and the HEMI is the easier answer and it's the more predictable answer in most people's hands. So for that reason, we offer that when even if there might be a reason why total hip was the right answer, you're trying to make a, make a process a whole bunch of different details at the same time rather than wait because we do know that whether we talk about 24 hours or 12 hours or 48 hours, personally I'm a 24 to 36 hour. I think, I think you optimize hip fracture patients. They are not a 20 year old tibia fracture. A lot of them are dehydrated. They come in with a million problems. Take 24 hours and get them tuned up and then get them done and get them done right. That's a separate conversation. But if you make those decisions in 24 hours, oftentimes the right most predictable answer in most people's hands because you don't have total joint arthroplasty surgeons on call to do this stuff 24 hours a day is to do the hemiarthroplasty. So what's the right answer? I think the right answer is careful patient selection try to avoid the paradox and make a careful decision in a short period of time. Know your own limitations as a surgeon and as a hospital and as a team on that day as you're entering the room and always cement. Over 70. Thanks. We'll do the post-debate survey. Okay, it still looks like hemiarthroplasty is the uh, victor here. So I think that uh, concludes our debate session for uh, hip fractures. If you can please leave your uh, audio, uh, audience response uh, system keypads.